With the release of Unity 2020.3 and later, a lot of my shader graph tutorials have become redundant and need an update. So if you would like to create a wonderful water shader while simultaneously learning the intermediates of shader graph, make sure to watch till the end. I will also be providing the shader file in the description for anybody that wants it. Smash the like button and if you are just finding my channel, subscribe! We're only like 70 subs away from 1000, so help me reach more people by subscribing and sharing. Okay, let's begin the tutorial. Let's start by either using an existing, correctly set up 2020.3 plus URP project or opening up a brand new one. I will do the latter as I recommend you do the same too because URP has a little little settings that I don't have time to explain. Go to the settings folder that URP comes with and find the three render pipeline assets. Inside each of these there will be an opaque and depth texture that you will need to activate. You can also put all of the URP preset folders into one backend folder like so. Now back in the main assets folder you will need to create a new shader graph file and material to accompany it. Follow that up by dragging the shader asset onto the material to allow us to add the shader to Unity objects. Create a plane in the hierarchy and after naming it whatever you want, you will drag the material onto the plane we created. Don't worry if the plane is pink, we will fix that right now. To fix the pink color, First, double click on the shader file and maximize the shader window by pressing shift space. Next, go to your graph settings and add a universal target to your active targets list. To save the shader, you'll need to click the save asset in the top left of the window. Your shader is now not pink. The two sections of the graph are called the vertex and the fragment. A shader graph goes through every vertex in the mesh and adjusts it. To be able to move around the vertices, we can use the position node and a little bit of math. You can see here that we can use the split node going out of the position node to get the individual XYZ values. There's a drop down in the position node where we can define the coordinate space that we want to get the vertex position in. Object returns the local space, while world returns the global space. The world position is useful for making our water tile, while the object selection, the one we want, is used for moving the vertices. Now in the shadow we have a split node from which we can get the XYZ components. So to pass it back to the shader, we can use a vector3 node. Connect up the outputs like so, and connect the vector3 output to the shader vertex position. Currently the setup is only getting and reassigning the vertex positions, though, so to change it, we can use a variable. Let's navigate to the blackboard where all of our variables will be, and by clicking on the plus icon we can create a new variable. This variable will be called height, then instead of assigning the vector3 y input using the split node, we can use the variable. After saving the asset, we can see the height of the water plane is changed by the variable. To access the variable, you will need to click on the material. This is cool but boring, so instead of the variable, let's use some gradient noise. To do this, we need to create a gradient noise node and assign the output to the Y position of the vector 3. This will always return the same noise value though as we are not feeding the gradient the vertex noise position. To do this, we create a new position world node. You'll need to split the position and convert the x and z into a vector 2. Then take the vector 2 output to a tiling and offset UV input. Connect the tiling and offset to the UV of the gradient noise. What this node tree does is it gets the vertex position on a 2D plane and tells the gradient noise to return the value for that in world position. The tiling and offset node is there so we can control more features of the noise, such as tiling, which we will not use today, and offset, for waves, which we will use now. To make waves, we need to create a new variable called wave scroll speed. Then, we create a time node and multiply the wave scroll speed by that time. Then, we take the out product and connect it to the offset and tiling nodes offset. This will make our noise move in a diagonal manner. We can also create a noise scale variable that will simply plug into the scale input of the gradient noise to control the detail of the noise. This will be useful in a couple minutes when we begin to work on the octave noise. Before that, we need to sort out the low poly effect. To do this, create the node tree that I'm creating here. In it, we take the object vertex position and take the d, d, y, and x. Then we find the cross product and normalize its output. We transform this into object tangent space using the transform node and plug it into the normal input of the fragment part of the shader. 
I cannot explain the low poly effect as I'm trying to keep this tutorial as beginner friendly and short as possible. We have flat shading and a simple water system working, but the noise is very smooth and odd. To fix this we first need to convert the noise node tree into a subgraph for simplicity's purpose. We do this by selecting all of the following nodes and right clicking on one of the selected nodes. Then go to convert, subgraph. Save the subgraph somewhere and now we have a simple noise node. You can double click the noise node to open it up in the shader view. Inside you'll need to add a variable called the octave factor. This value will control the opacity and the noise scale of the noise. If you don't know how octaves work, they work by creating many noise values of increasing noise scale and decreasing opacity and then adding them together. You can see here that without changing the opacity and adding all the finer and finer noises together, the octave noise function looks very bad. But if we make finer noise functions affect the end results less and less exponentially, then we can create some very nice detailed noise. Just make the following simple edits to this noise subgraph and we can go back into the shader. Back in the shader, we'll create as many noise nodes as octaves that you want. Here I have 6 because that's what I found works best. Then I assign the scroll speed and the noise scale to each of those. To the octave factors, we assign values of powers of 2, so 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 and 32. Then we need to add together each element together in this manner. If you use some other way, the addition values may be added together multiple times. Then we need to take the output of the additions and remap it to return it to the 0 and 1 range. Now we can use this in the vertex displacement to create the waves. We can also simplify the vertex displacement. We will do this by deleting the split and the vector 3 node. Now let's add the noise value to the position node. Before you add the noise value though, you will need to multiply the noise by the height variable to control the height of the water like so. This will make the vertices move around in the x and the z positions too. This creates better waves and then just Y displacement. The game scene now shows some nice water that looks pretty detailed. Now let's get the firm and the depth color working. To create the firm and the depth fade, we will use the depth texture. Let's start by getting the main water color working. To use the depth texture, we will need to create the following node tree. What it does, it gets the scene depth value and subtracts from that the screen position. This gives us the depth texture from the scene. Then we divide the difference by a depth fade variable and saturate the quotient. The saturate node just makes sure that the scene depth is between 0 and 1. Now we create a loop node that either shallow or deep color are shown depending on the scene depth. Plug this into the base color and the water color now works. So an overview of the depth color. We first subtract the scene depth from the screen position's alpha to get the depth texture of the scene. Then we divide this by our depth fade to adjust the intensity. After making the depth texture come between 0 and 1 using the saturate node and lapping between the two deep and shallow colors, we take the output to the base color and the color of our water now works. To make the transparency of the colors work, we go back to the shader and split the output of the lerp. Then we use the alpha output of the color and plug it into the transparency. Creating foam is quite similar. To do that, instead of saturating and lerping the node, we just get the output of the divide and then we use a steps edge input. You can also add the noise subgraph onto your step to add some variability to the foam. 
Now we create the foam color variable and assign it to the end of the step. We also create a new float variable for the foam width and assign that to the B of the division instead of the depth fade. This will allow us to control the amount of foam. Now add together the depth and the foam. Finally, to add reflections, you create a smoothness variable and assign it to the smoothest value of the fragments part of the shader. And that is basically your shader done. Here are my settings if you want to copy them. And here is the model of the little she shack that I used. It's amazing the things that people provide on the internet for free. Speaking of that, if you liked this video and you learned something from it, make sure to drop a sub. Again, I'm super close to 1k, so if we could get there by the end of the year, that would be fantastic. Maybe even this week. With that, I thank you for watching and I wish you the best of luck in your future projects.